podcast you're listening to right now and subscribe to Strange Year wherever you listen to podcasts. A poem, a code, a dead man. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. I love Australia. I love the people, the culture. My brother lives there. Australia also has some of the most fascinating true crime, weird haunted stuff. It has a life all of its own. The Qantas bomb hoax one exactly. did was Australia. Exactly. And my brother listened to that. He liked it. He might send us his thoughts. I hope he does. He's very busy at his real job. Um, so, but he, but... Okay, we were talking about this, and he talked about how much he enjoyed it. And then he sent me this case. And oh my God. You think your siblings, that you're like, yeah, they know me well. My brother knows me so well. He sent me an unsolved case. One of the, I wouldn't say it's the most famous, but it is of an unidentified man found dead at 6.30 a.m. on December 1st, 1948 at Somerton Park Beach, just south of where he lives in Adelaide, South Australia. It is, the case is known as the mystery of the Somerton man or the Tamam Shud case after a Persian poem. Oh my God, we're going to get to it. We're going to get into it. You're like, dead man, get it. Next, bring a book. No, wait. This unfolds like no case. You have an insane amount of notes. So. I have so many notes and I apologize. I'm going to stumble through them. We're going to discuss them. We're going to hash it out. But I just want to thank my brother, Stephen Lee, for sending this to me because he, he knew that I would really be into this. Um, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, so on, uh, again, December 1st, 1948, at 6.30 a.m., the police were contacted after the body of a man was discovered at Somerton Beach near Glenelg, Glenelg, G-L-E-N-E-L-G, Glenelg, Glenelg. Nope, that's not right. About 608 miles southwest of Adelaide, South Australia. Um, the man, sorry, six miles, 6.08. We're already off to a great start. The man was found lying in the sand across from the crippled children's home, which is what it was called. I'm not, I know, I know, but that's what it was called. not being insensitive. No, it's called the crippled children's home. I'm glad it exists, which was on the corner of the Espelande and Bickford Terrace. Man found dead, right? No big deal. Again, a day in the life. Well, a big deal probably to the, him and maybe the people that knew yeah. him. Yeah, but other perhaps. than that, other than the people that are into the true crime Listen, or crime in one, general. Listen, another dead body, another day, yeah. right? We're all amateur detectives on this wild ride. So here's what the authorities knew right then. He was lying back with his head resting against the wall with his legs extended and his feet crossed. It was believed he had died while sleeping. I'm familiar, I'm familiar with this. Just by that thing it i don't know maybe somebody said did you know or like a Uh a, a today i learned type Uh thing uh and because of the way he was propped up Mm -hmm. that makes it like how does that just like how did how did this end up being i don't know anything more about it or what it was called or anything just that little detail is familiar okay good no i'm done i mean i'm done i I need to know everything i need to know (laughs) okay fine (laughs) case closed (laughs) next podcast uh no please don't okay so he had an unlit cigarette on the right collar of his coat A search of his pockets revealed an unused second-class rail ticket from Adelaide to Henley Beach, a bus ticket from the city that seemed unused, a narrow aluminum American comb, a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, gross, an Army Club cigarette packet containing seven cigarettes of a different brand, and a quarter full box of Bryant and May matches. So this man, and we're going to put some pictures up. Uh, probably there's actually a lot of pictures of just his his body, but he was a really well dressed man. This is not someone like you know you think like someone on the beach found dead. You're like oh like a homeless person, a vagrant, someone who had to sleep outside for some reason. You I think that's where my brain goes. Um, just with the state of Australia and the state of homelessness, this is a really nicely dressed man with imports of cigarettes, um, different products that you wouldn't get if you weren't upper middle class. If you didn't have the means. Exactly. Exactly. I also want to talk a little bit about, uh, 
Australia in 19 in the 40s too. So we are coming off the war. We are coming into the Cold War. There's a lot that's happening in Australia politically with this and what we're doing. Um, communism is a big concern of Australia's uh, where they kind of fall in the pecking order of European countries and America too. And Australia has always been really syncophantic with America. They kind of follow America's lead politically in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of people who are really worried about the Cold War, about Russians, about espionage. This will factor in later. Got it? I do got it. I checked to make sure I <laughs> Yeah. I, I, got I don't it. think I've ever checked in to make sure you got it at any podcast. Ever. Nope. No. <laughs> okay. There were witnesses too. Uh, there are some witnesses who said... Uh, made testimony that they saw this man alive. They came forward and said that on the evening of the 30th of November, they saw an individual resembling the dead man lying on his back in the same spot and position near the crippled children's home, where the corpse was later found. A couple to, who saw him around 7 p.m. noted that they saw him extend his right arm to its fullest extent and then drop it limply. Another couple who saw him from 7.30 to 8 p.m., they said that uh, they recounted they didn't see him move, but that maybe he had changed... Uh, positions a little bit, um, or that his body was kind of uh, shaking. Although they commented between themselves that it was odd that he was not reacting to the mosquitoes, which were pretty crazy in Australia at that time of year, because it's summer there uh, during the November, December months, they thought it was more likely that he was drunk or asleep and didn't investigate further. Again, just a person on the beach. Who knows? Do not bother. Do not inquire further. One of the witnesses told the police she observed a man looking down at the sleeping man from the top of the steps that led to the beach. Witnesses said the body was in the same position when the police viewed it. All right. Okay. Another witness came forward in 1959, much later, and reported to the police that he and three others had seen a well-dressed man carrying another man on his shoulders along Somerton Beach that night before the body was found. A police report was made by Detective Don O'Doherty. So then we talk about the pathologist who examined him, John Burton Cleland, and here are the, these, these are quotes from him describing his examination of the dead body. The man was of Britisher appearance and thought to be aged about 40 to 45. He was in top physical condition. He was 5 foot 11 inches tall. He had gray eyes, Ooh, fair to ginger colored hair, which was slightly gray around the temples. He had broad shoulders and a narrow waist, hands and nails that showed no signs of manual labor, big and little toes that met in a wedge shape like those of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes, and pronounced high calf muscles consistent with the people who regularly wore boots or shoes with high heels or performed ballet. Interesting. He was a fancy pants. So he far. was. He was a fancy man. He was dressed in a white shirt, a red, white, and blue tie, very patriotic, not for Australia, trousers, socks, and shoes, a brown knitted pullover, and a fashionable gray and brown double-breasted jacket of reportedly American tailoring. This is an international fancy man. All of the labels on his clothes had been removed. He had no hat, which was very unusual for 1948. He had no wallet, no ID. He was cleanly shaven and recently shaven, and his dental records were not able to be matched with any known person. Just a dude on a beach. I mean, the missing wallet and hat are understandable. Hats mm-hmm. blow off, you know, they're not sure. really, uh, and wallets being missing is, you know. Yeah, that's part and parcel for, I think, finding a body. An autopsy was conducted, and the pathologist estimated that the time of death was around 2 a.m. on December 1st. Here's a quote from the autopsy. The heart was of normal size and normal in every way. Small vessels not commonly observed in the brain were easily discernible with congestion. There were congestion of the pharynx, and the gullet was covered with the whitening of superficial layers of the mucosa with a patch of ulceration in the middle of it. The stomach was deeply congested. There was congestion in the second half of the duodendum. Don't know where that is. There was blood mixed with the food in, in his stomach. Both kidneys were congested, and the liver contained a great excess of blood in its vessels. The spleen was strikingly large, about three times the normal size. There was destruction of the center of the liver lobules revealed under the microscope, acute gastritis, hemorrhage, extensive congestions of the liver and spleen, and the congestion of the brain. So when they say congestion, they mean like blood clot, uh, everything r- mixed and riddled with blood. So he was like a blood-logged body. So the outside was uh-huh. seemed really well put together. The inside, not so much. Yeah, the inside was a bag of blood. The outside was um, American-imported man about town. The autopsy also showed that the man's last meal was a pasty eaten three to four hours before death, but tests failed to reveal any foreign substance in the body. The pathologist concluded, I am quite convinced the death could not have been natural. The poison I suggested was a barbiturate or a soluble hip- hypotonic. 
Although poison remained a prime suspicion, the pasty was not believed to be the source of the poison. Other than that, the coroner was unable to reach a conclusion to the man's identity, cause of death, or whether the man had been seen alive at Somerton Beach on the evening of 30th of November with the same... Uh, they couldn't tell if they were the same man. Uh, no one had seen his face or like really could recognize his face. The body was embalmed on December 10th, 1948, after the police were unable to get a positive identification. The police said this was the first time they knew anything about like an unsolved case of this nature, of not no, no dental records, no ability to identify from friends or family. This is the first time. And this no one involving, calling like police stations or hospitals saying, hey, uh, yeah, I'm missing know, somebody. Buddy, like, this is like a this. small suburb of Adelaide, which is already a small city in Australia. Very remote. So it kind of feels part and parcel to cops having unprecedented experience with something like this. So that was December 1st, 1948. Let's cut to January 14th, 1949. Okay. Staff at the Adelaide Railway Station, we're just going about their I business. I can tell this is where things are, I oh, yeah, can Things tell. are going to go a little off the rails. Yeah, that's, that's what I like. So our friends at the Adelaide Railway Station were just doing their jobs when they discovered a brown suitcase with its label removed, which had been checked into the station cloak, cloak room after 11 a.m. on the 30th of November, 1948. So they were like, okay, okay, let's check this out. They opened the suitcase, and in it were a red checked dressing gown, a size 7 red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underpants, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician screwdriver, a table knife cut down into a short, sharp instrument, a pair of scissors with sharpened points, a small square of zinc thought to have been used as protective sheath for the knife and scissors, and a stenciling brush uh, as used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. Also in the suitcase was a thread card of Barber brand orange wax thread of an unusual type, not available in Australia. It was the same that was used to repair the lining in a pocket of the trousers that the dead man was wearing. All identification marks on the clothes had been removed, but police found the name T. Keene, K-E-A-N-E, on a tie, K-E-A-N-E, on a laundry bag, and then K-E-A-N, without that E, on a singlet, along with three-day dry-cleaning marks um, on the 7th of November. Um, sorry, these are just numbers. They're not dates. They're just dry cleaning tags. Police believe that whoever removed the clothing tags either overlooked these three items or purposefully left the Keen tags on the clothes, knowing Keen was not the dead man's name. With wartime rationing still enforced in Australia, which is also an interesting point, clothing was difficult to acquire at that time, and he had a lot of it and nice stuff. Although it was common practice to use name tags, it was also common when buying secondhand clothing to remove the tags of the previous owners. What was unusual was that there were no spare socks found in the case, no correspondence, although the police found pencils and unused letters stationary. A search conducted that there were no T. Keens missing in any English-speaking country, and a nationwide circulation of the dry cleaning marks also didn't go anywhere. In fact, all that could be found from the suitcase was that the front gusset and feather stitching on a coat found in the case indicated that it had been manufactured in the United States. The coat had not been imported, indicating the man had been to the United States, uh, or sorry, indicating the man was probably there and had bought some coats, bought some things of a similar size. He's checked incoming train records and believed the man had arrived in Adelaide by overnight train, either from Melbourne, Sydney, or Port Augusta. They speculated he had showered and shaved at city baths, although there were no tickets on his body before returning to the train station to purchase a ticket for the 10.50 a.m. train to Henley Beach, which, for whatever reason, had, he had missed or didn't catch. Also, despite the name, City Baths was not like a public bathing area. It was like a pool. It was like kind of like a gross swimming pool. That you would just kind of, on the, on the sly, go in and maybe Yeah, you like or- shower or whatever, like get that shit together. So this guy immediately checked his suitcase at the station room before leaving the station and cas- catching a bus to Glenelg. The railway station bathing facilities were there. Like, the railway station had places to shower and, like, get yourself together, too, which is also important um, and much more convenient. The city baths were accessed from the station's northern exit via this laneway that he would take this bus to. There is no record of the station's bathroom facilities being unavailable or the day he arrived. We have no idea why he went to the city baths, which were close to the beach, where he was found. All right, another piece of evidence. Pop it in there. So John Burton Cleland, the guy I quoted before and who had examined the body initially, re-examined the body on June 17th, 1949, as did Coroner Thomas Erskine Cleland. 
um, Erskine Clearland, who was a, his brother and another coroner. So we got a coroner bros on the case. Here are notes from the coroner after this examination. The man's shoes were remarkably clean and appeared to have been recently polished rather than being in the state expected of shoes of a man who had apparently been wandering around the beach all day. Evidence fitted in with the theory that the body might have been brought to Somerton Beach after the man's death, accounting for the lack of evidence of vomiting and convulsions, which are two main physiological reactions to poison. Um, None of the witnesses could positively identify the man they saw the previous night as being the same person discovered that morning, there remained the possibility the man had died somewhere else and had been dumped at the beach. He stressed that this was purely speculation and the witnesses definitely believed it was the same person. Cedric Station Hicks, professor of physiology and pharmacology at the University of Adelaide, testified that a group of drugs, variants of a drug called number one and number two, very mysterious, uh, were extremely toxic in a relatively small oral dose and would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to identify even if it had been suspected in the first instance. So this is the guy that came in to talk about the poison and seeing if poison was really a part of how this man died. Um, he gave the po- coroner a piece of paper with the names of the two drugs which was, were entered in as Exhibit C-18. The names were not released to the public until the 1980s, as at the time they were quite easily procurable by the ordinary individual from a chemist without the need to give a reason for the purchase. So this is like very uh, common poison, but you may not know unless you had some kind of affiliation with um, toxicology, the government. So they're worried about people maybe trying duplicating to get them, so, it, yeah, like getting reason. it, giving yeah. them ideas, putting exactly. ideas in their head. Yeah. It's like these poisons are easy to come by and they leave like no trace in the body. So they're like, well, maybe this is why this guy died. Um, anyway... He noted that the only fact not found in relation to the body was evidence of vomiting. He then stated that its absence was not unknown, but that he could not make a frank conclusion about this guy being poisoned without it. The toxicologist stated that if death had occurred seven hours after the man was last seen to move, it would imply a massive dose that could still have been undetectable. It was noted that the movement seen by witnesses at 7 p.m. could have been the last convulsion preceding death. Um, Earlier in the inquiry, uh, the the coroner said, I would be prepared to find that if he died from poison, that the poison was probably a glucoside, that it was not accidentally administered, but I cannot say whether it was administered by the deceased himself or by some other person. Despite these findings, he could not determine the cause of death of this guy. Uh, Cleland, the um, coroner, remained that if the body had been carried to its final resting place, that all difficulties would disappear. There was a plaster cast made of the man's head and shoulders. The lack of success in determining the identity and cause of the death of this guy was incredibly puzzling to authorities who called it an unparalleled mystery and really didn't think they would know what happened. So we're going to take a break there and then we're going to get right back into it. All right. I love it. You into it? You know, uh, I I mean, it's 1948, but I mean, the idea of somebody being missing that seems to be well put together. Mm Mm-hmm. Makes me at least, I mean, I, I can infer that they uh, knew other people, that they just yeah. weren't a complete and total just loner. Like a man in a vacuum. You know, if he was somebody who was like, listen, I've been you know, um, kind of uh, distanced from everyone else I've known for 30 years. Yeah. Maybe people would be like, I don't know, that could have been my father that left us when we were five. I don't know. But this mm-hmm. seems like somebody who would have known somebody at some point. Point and be in like, their oh, whole lives. Yeah, and and 1940. It's not like in, you know, photo, there's photography. Yeah, you know, there's you know, have you seen this? It wasn't milk cartons back then, but there was yeah. something similar, some kind of uh, communication. And not if, one if someone's you know, missing. Like not somebody's just being like, yeah. oh yeah, I it's know that like dude. It's a mine. random. It's it's like they had hit a wall until now. Oh. So during the inquest, something else very mysterious was found on the man's body. So this is the second time they examined the body. They missed this the first time entirely. Sewn on into the dead man's trouser pocket, so inside the pocket, was a tiny piece of rolled up paper with oh boy. the words Tamam Shud printed on it. Public library officials called in to translate the text, identified it as a phrase meaning ended or finished, found on the last page of the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. Um, the paper's other side was blank. Police conducted an Australia-wide search to find a copy of the book that had that blank page. So it was cut out from the book. Oh, okay. So it was, yeah. yeah. From books. So they were like, okay, the other side is blank. So that means like we can try to test this paper. Um, there's a picture. Oh, I don't know if there's actually a picture of this specifically, but there are like the books and like going through them. And they're like, all right, 
all over Australia looking for this book. Of, and the, the Ruby out of Oma Kayam is this book of poetry. It's about mortality. It's about life cycles. It's supposed to be very beautifully written. Um, a photograph of the scrap of paper was released to the press. Following a public appeal by the police, the copy of the Rubaiyat from which the paint had, uh, was torn out was finally located. A man showed the police a 1941 edition of the 1859 translation of the Rubaiyat, published by Whitcomb and Tombs in New Zealand. Detective Sergeant Lionel Lean, who led the initial investigation, often protected the privacy of witnesses in public statements by using pseudonyms. Lean referred to the man who found the book by the pseudonym Ronald Francis, and he had never he has never been officially identified, and this will happen again later and will cause a lot of confusion with when anyone has tried to research this case. It's really hard because stuff gets lost, as we'll talk about later, and people have these pseudonyms and their information has not been kept up. And they're doing that to protect the people who are involved in the case or who become involved in the case. But it's also like anytime you want to investigate, you can't. Like, you don't even know where to start. You have these weird statements, and you're like, I don't even know how to find out if this is a thing because I don't have... At one point, we had this information, now we don't. It's like regression. So Francis, Ronald Francis, pseudonym of the guy who had the book, has not considered that the book might be connected to the case until he had seen an article in the previous day's newspaper. On the inside back cover of the book, detectives identified indentations from handwriting. These included a telephone number, an unidentified number, and a text that resembled an encrypted message. According to statements by the police, the book was found in the rear footwell of a car about the same time that the body of the unidentified man had been found. There are some inconsistencies and ambiguities about the finding of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. One newspaper article refers to the book being found about a week or two before the body was found. Former South Australian police detective Gary Feltis, who dealt with the manor as a cold case later, reports that the book was found just after that man was found on the beach at Somerton. The timing is significant because based on the suitcase, the man was supposed to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found on the beach. If a book was found one or two weeks before, it probably meant that the man had visited previously or had been to Adelaide for a longer period. Most accounts state that the book was found in an unlocked car parked on the road near near Glen Elleg, Glen Elleg, either in the rear floor well or the back seat. The handwriting found in the back of the book of the Rabat of Omar Khayyam is presumed to be some kind of code. The theme of the book is that one should live life to its fullest and have no regrets. Again, it's kind of poetic. It talks about life cycles. The poem's subjects led police to theorize that the man had committed suicide by poison, although there was no other evidence, again, that we talked about to really establish that. It's still kind of up in the air. The book was missing the words, Tamam Shoot, on the last page, which had the blank um, paper cut out of it, and a microscopic test indicated that the piece of paper was from the page torn from the book. Found it. Identified it. Also in the back of the book were faint indentations, those uh, lines of text, capital letters. The second line had been struck out, the fact that it is considered significant due to similarities to the fourth line and the possibility that it represents an error in encryption. So here are the things that they found, those indentations. Was the, and I'm going to just show it to you, but it's like W-R-G-O-A-B-A-B-D. Then M-L-I-A-O-I crossed out. W-T-B-I-M-P-A-N-E-T-P. M L I A B O A I A Q C I T T M T S A M S T G A B. What is that? Um, so they have they released this to the media too because they're like we have no idea what this is. This has got to be some kind of code or something based on the book. So at first the letters were thought to be in a foreign language, but. Code experts were called in at the time to decipher the lines were incredibly unsuccessful. In 1978, following a request from ABC TV, cryptographers analyzed the handwritten text. The cryptographers reported that it would be impossible to provide a satisfactory answer because it, they didn't have enough symbols, so nothing could really be decoded. They didn't have enough to create a key to make sure. And then they were like, maybe he was just crazy and just like writing these letters down. Now, also in the back of the book, was an unlisted telephone number belonging to a nurse named Jessica Ellen Joe Thompson. She was born Jessie Harkness in the Sydney suburb of Merrickville, who lived in Mosley Street in Glen Elleg, very close to where this man was found. So we have this unlisted number also found in the back of the book. The police got there, interviewed her, and she said that she did not know a dead man or why he would have her phone number and chose to visit her suburb on the night of his death. However, she also reported that 
at some time in late 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next-door neighbor about her. In a book on the case, uh, Gary Feltis, who we mentioned before, stated that when he interviewed Thompson back in 2002, he found that she was being evasive or just didn't want to talk about it. Feltis believed that Thompson knew that's the Summerton man's identity. Uh, her daughter, this woman, did a television interview and said that her mom absolutely know, knew who this guy was. But she was playing dumb. Didn't want to think about it. Didn't want to talk about it. In 1949, Jessica Thompson requested the police did not keep a permanent record of her name or release her detail to third parties. The police agreed, a decision that really, again, messed with later investigations. They respected her. It's like, where does a, where does a police person be like respecting someone who might be involved in a, in a dead man's case or a murder or suicide or whatever? And where are they like, no, we actually need to keep your stuff because we might need to go back to this case. You yeah, know? I mean, you're, you know, unfortunately you're involved, but you are, you're involved and you don't really get to say, oh, you know, I just don't feel like being involved. Like yeah. You get that, I mean, it's kind of a luxury. Yeah, uh, it is kind of a luxury. Unfortunately, it's, it's a bit of a luxury. Yeah. And the police were like, okay, no problem. Um, we will respect your privacy. Because of this, Thompson was frequently referred to by lots of pseudonyms, including the nickname uh, Jetson and names such as Teresa Johnson, Teresa Powell. Uh, Feltis claimed he was given permission by Thompson's family to disclose her names and that of her husband, Prosper Thompson. Nevertheless, the names Feltis used in his book were pseudonyms. Um, a lot of interviews have pseudonyms. A lot of the things I found were like, oh, was that a pseudonym for her? Or like, what name is that? Okay. Felton also stated that her family did not know of her connection with the case, and he agreed not to disclose her identity or anything that might reveal it. Her real name was not considered important, as the possibility exists that it may be the decryption key for the code in the back of the book. Um. Yeah, was important. Did I say not important? Was absolutely important. Yeah, very crucial. So now we have this person and this name and this the connection. closest the closest thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're you're spending a lot of time trying to figure this out, right? Which is what it seems. Yeah, it doesn't seem like they're trying to sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. They get probably the, one of the closest things that might be, and they're just like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, and they're like, no, oh, all right. I feel weird today. Yeah, Can you I, come back never. I mean, you, you think about now. I mean, I, I don't really. I can't speak on Australia in 1948, but I can mm -hmm. speak on literally any other time in the United States or pretty much anywhere. Where it's like, no, yeah, you're now you are involved in this thing, and you don't get to decide whether you yeah. feel like not being involved. It feels very privileged too, and so many things like him being close to her suburb, people inquiring about her. So many things make it obvious that she was somehow involved, or could provide information to yes. make further this investigation. Yes, yeah. so remember that plaster cast of his uh, head and shoulders. So she was shown that, and she said she could not identify the person depicted. According to the detective at the time, he described her reaction upon seeing this cast as completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance that she was about to faint. So about to faint, she's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. In an interview many years later, uh, Paul Lawson, the technician who made the cast, who was present when Thompson viewed it, noted that after looking at the cast, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Okay, so great liar. She's great. Thompson also said that while she was working at the Royal North Shore Hospital in Sydney during World War II, she had owned a copy of the Rubaiyat. Huh. In 1949, at the Clifton Gardens Hotel in Sydney, she had given it to an army lieutenant named Alf Boxel, who was serving at the time in the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. Thompson told police that after the war ended, she had moved to Melbourne and married. She said that she had received a letter from Boxall and had replied telling him that she was, hey, married. Subsequent research suggests that her future husband, Prosper Thompson, was in the process of obtaining a divorce from his first wife, and he did not marry her really until 1950. But they were together. She was starting her new life. There is no evidence that Boxall had any contact with Harkness after 1945. As a result of their conversations with Thompson, police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in July 1949, he was found in Sydney, and the final page of his copy of the Rubaiyat, reportedly a 1924 edition, not the same, was intact and the words Tamam Shud still in place. Boxall was now working in the maintenance section of the Randwick bus depot, where he'd worked before the war, and was aware of any link between the dead man and himself. In the front of the copy of the Rubaiyat that was given to Boxall, Jessica Harkness had signed herself Jetson and written out verse 70. And that verse is, Indeed, indeed, repentance oft before I swore, but was I sober when I swore? 
And then came the spring and the rose in hand, my threadbare penitence of pieces tore. So a lot of regret, a lot of things happening. So she gave this guy a copy. How many, first of all, books of poetry of this is is floating around Australia, a lot of it, whatever. Something, obviously, we don't know. Some, but this guy was found, and he's alive. But then it's like, where did this book... Okay. We still... We're putting together pieces, but in doing so, it's like an episode of Lost, where you're like, you get more information. You're like, well, what do I do with this information? You know what I mean? In 1949, the man from the Somerton Beach bench was buried in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery, where the Salvation Army, Army conducted the service. The South Australian Grandstand Book... Makers Association paid for the service to not have him just like be dumped somewhere in I don't know like I guess you get cremated if there's no one to claim your remains or anything I'm not sure what happens to you years after the burial flowers began appearing at the grave police questioned a woman seen leaving the cemetery but she claimed she knew nothing of man about the same time Ina Harvey the receptionist from the Strathmore Hotel opposite Adelaide Railway Station revealed that a strange man had stayed in room 21 or 23 for days around the time of the death checking out November 30th, 1948. She said he was an English speaking and only carried a small black case, not unlike the musician or a doctor might carry. When an employee looked inside the case, he told Harvey had found an object inside described looking kind of like a needle. <sighs> so more things, more information being surfaced. On November 22nd, 1959, an inmate named E.B. Collins, who was incarcerated in New, Zealand, New Zealand's Wangui prison, claimed to know the identity of the dead man. He didn't give much more information than that, and I couldn't find any more information than that, but there have been numerous unsuccessful attempts in the 60 years since his discovery to crack the letters found in the rear of the book, including the efforts by military, naval intelligence, mathematicians, amateur code crackers. In 2004, retired detective Gary Feltis, that we, again, talked about before, suggested that uh, the final line, I-T-T-M-T-S-A-M-S-T-G-A-B, could stand for the initials, it's time to move South Australia Mosley Street. The former nurse um, lived on Mosley Street, and it, that's the main road through Glenelg. A 2014 analysis by computational linguist John Reeling also supports the theory that the letters are some kind of initials of an English text, but he couldn't find a match to what literature and said that they're probably shorthands, not a code at all, and that we're probably not going to figure it out what he ever meant to say. So thanks for being positive, John Reeling. In 1994, John Harbour Phillips, Chief Justice of Victoria and Chairman of the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, reviewed the case to determine that the cause of death and concluded that there seems to, uh, to be little doubt that it was digilius, which is a steroid that gives you a powerful heart attack, which, again, I don't know what, how close the steroid is to that poison that we talked about earlier, but Phillips thought that this, because the organs were engorged and because there was no natural reason for him just to die. So engorged, like we talk about the blood-logged um, organ. And again, these are very different interpretations of this man's death, but possibly by a similar powerful drug or steroid. Former South Australian Chief Superintendent Len Brown, who worked on the case in the 1940s, stated that he believes the man was from a country in the Warsaw Pact, which led to the police's inability to confirm the man's identity. So the Warsaw Pact was a Cold War treaty in 1955, um, which meant that he had some kind of um, high government status. Uh, They didn't have clearance or information on his identity. We're not sure. The South Australian Police Historic Society hold the bust, which contains strands of the man's hair, too. Um, So they have hair, they have the bust. Any further attempts to identify the body have been hampered by the embalming process, which destroyed most of the DNA. And apparently, I guess, since they have the hair, that doesn't work either, or, like, they tested it and they couldn't use it. There's no other evidence that exists. The brown suitcase was destroyed in 1986. The statements that police have filed over the years and all the people that have written in are all gone. So we're losing evidence, we're gaining information, we're losing more evidence, we're getting information that doesn't make sense with prior evidence, and it's just a giant tangle of a mess. And it seems like they're spending, you know, every couple of years they're going back and and reevaluating yeah. what's happening, but it, it seems to be like at a, a thing of trying to, you know, decode text and stuff like that. Yeah. And not, not somebody saying, claiming to be like, yeah, that was my 
blank. Yeah. My brother, my cousin, my uncle, my father. Yeah, this friend, Jessica over. Thompson woman who's obviously involved somehow but doesn't want to talk at all. So there's been a lot of theories, possible identities, speculation, updates. Um, a lot of people thought that this man was a spy due to the circumstances and historical context of, the, of his death. At least two sites relatively close to Adelaide were of interest to spies, the Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Woomera Test Range, an Anglo-Australian military research facility. The man's death coincided with the reorganization of Australian security agencies, which would culminate the following year in the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, which is like our CIA. This would be followed by a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia, which was revealed by intercepts of Soviet communications under the Venona Project. Another theory concerns Alf Boxall, the guy who kind of flirted with Jessica Thompson, who was involved in intelligence work during and immediately after World War II. In a 1978 television interview, Stuart Littlemore asks, Mr. Boxall, you've been working, had you, in an intelligence unit before you met this young woman, Jessica. Did you talk to her at all about this? In reply, Boxall said no. And when asked if Harkness could have known, Boxall replied, not unless somebody else told her. When Littlemore suggests in the interview that there may have been some espionage connection to the dead men in Adelaide, Boxall replied... It's quite a melodramatic thesis, isn't it? Boxall's Army Service records suggest that he was served in the 4th Water Transport Company before being seconded to the North Australia Observer Unit, a special operations unit, and then during his time, uh, he rose in rank, was promoted to corporal, and then to lieutenant within three months. So is there some kind of something where the names, the identity of Alf Boxall and this man were had dovetailed? Did he take on the identity of this person? Did he kill this person? Is there espionage involved? Like, I mean, yeah. that makes... I mean, that, of course, obviously, you know, like, it romanticizes it, kind mm-hmm. of like, uh, kind of, you know, kind of sweetens the pot, you know? Yeah. But also... Spies are sexy. But also, it, it's a way to just be like, well, then anything could be that. <laughs> yeah, anything is a spy. Yeah. It's, My cat's a spy. Sure. You know, like, I don't know. We're spies. Yeah. You spy? But, well, I am, but I... I, you can't say I'm not good at it because I just told you I was. Yeah, you're a bad spy. Yeah. You're gonna be found dead on a beach someday. Uh oh. But everyone's gonna know why I was like, oh yeah, that dude. Uh. Oh yeah, we know that guy. <laughs> yeah. We've seen his YouTube videos. And it's like there's gonna be no words of poetry because he doesn't read. So <laughs> that's so sad. Isn't it? That's sadder than anything I've talked about mm-hmm. in this episode. So by early February 1949, there have been eight different positive identifications of the body, including two men who thought the body was a friend of theirs, others who thought it was a missing station worker, a worker on a steamship, this Swedish guy. Detectives from the state of Victoria initially believed the man was from there because of the similarity of the laundry marks to those used by several dry cleaning firms in Melbourne. Following publication of the man's photograph in Victoria, 28 people claimed to know his identity. Victorian detectives disproved all claims and said that other investigations indicated it was unlikely that he was from Victoria. In March 2009, a University of Adelaide team led by a professor began an attempt to solve the case again through cracking the code and proposing to exhume the body to test for DNA. Any DNA that may have been left in there after that whole embalming debacle. His investigations have led to questions on assumptions police had made in the case. Uh, So Abbott had tracked down the barber waxed cotton of the period and found packaging variations. This may provide clues to the country where it was purchased. Decryption of the code was being started from scratch from the beginning. It had been determined that the letter frequency was considerably different from letters written down randomly. The frequency was to be further tested to determine if the alcohol level of the writer could also alter the distribution of the letters. The format of the code also appeared to follow a quatrain format of the Rubiat, supporting the theory that the code was a one-time pad encryption encryption algorithm. Copies of the Rubaiyat, as well as the Talmud, the Bible, were being compared to the code using computers to get a statistical base of the letter frequencies. It's all very science. It's a very mathematical um, inquiry into that. However, the code's short length meant the investigators would require the exact edition of the book that was used. With the original copy lost in the 1960s, of course, researchers have been looking for a Fitzgerald edition without success. So maybe someone else will like pop up and like bring us this same edition so they could do more with that code. An investigation has shown, shown that the Somerton man's autopsy reports of 1948-1949 are now missing from the collection. The notes don't have anything on the case. Uh, a professor of anatomy at the University of Adelaide examined the images of the Somerton man's ears and found that his symbia, upper ear hollow, is larger than his cavium, lower ear hollow, a feature possessed by only 1-2% to of the Caucasian population. Can that be helpful? 
In May 2009, Derek Abbott consulted with a dental expert who concluded the Summerton man had hypodontia, which is a rare genetic disorder of both lateral incisors, a feature present in only 2% of the general population. In June 2010, Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, Robin, which clearly showed that he, like the unknown man, had, had not only a large symbia and cavium, but also hypodontia. How about that? What? <laughs> the chance that this was a coincidence was estimated at between 1 in 10 million and 1 in 20 million. So now we got this fucking kid. Yeah. It was a kid of that guy. It probably died. I mean, he did die, yeah. but probably due to violent circumstances or something outside of our knowledge. So then we get this turn in the case. We got this kid that was probably the kid of the dead man. And we link Jessica to this guy more formally. The media has suggested that Robin Thompson, who was 16 months old in 1948 and died in 2009, may have been the child of either Alf Boxell or some other, or the Somerton man, and was passed off as Jessica Thompson's and Prosper Thompson's son, or her new husband's son. DNA testing would confirm or eliminate this speculation. Abbott believes the um, exhumation and autosomal DNA test could link the Somerton man to a short list of surnames, which, along with the existing clues to the man's identity, would be the final piece of the puzzle. However, in October 2011, Attorney General John Rao refused permission to exhume the body, stating there needs to be public interest reasons that go well beyond public curiosity or broad scientific interests. So they can't get to that body to make those conclusions. So Felta said he was still contacted by people in Europe who believed the man was a missing relative but did not believe in exhumation and found the man's family grouping would provide answers to relatives. And during the period, so many war criminals changed their names and changed and changed our countries, changed our identities. So we're in this state where it's not only, it wouldn't even, it would be hard to solve this crime in a regular non-post-war time state without a lot of spy identity, international kind of tumult. But we have that, too, on top of this. In February 2018, a University of Adelaide team obtained a high-definition analysis of the mitochondrial DNA from the hair sample from the Summerton man. Again, we still have that hair with that uh, bust. They found that he and his mother belonged to haplogroup 4 H4ALALA, which is possessed by only 1% of Europeans. So finally, we're getting some stuff that links Jessica to this dude who died and her child, which is the child of either him or the guy she dated in the war, Art Baxall. In November 2013, relatives of Jetson, Jessica, gave interviews to television current affairs program 60 Minutes. Kate Thompson, daughter of Jessica and Prosper Thompson, said that her mother was the woman interviewed by the police and that her mother had told them that she had lied to them. Jessica did know the identity of the Somerton man, and his identity was also known to a level higher than the police force. Her father had died in 1995, and her mother had died in 2007. Uh, so Jessica and whoever, uh, and, and Prosper. Kate Thompson su- suggested that her mother and the Somerton man may both have been spies, noting that Jessica Thompson taught English to, to migrants, was interested in communism, and could inexplicably speak Russian. When she asked her mom why this was, her mom just refused to answer her. It's an interesting in classic tactic. Jessica Thompson yeah. way. So Robin Thompson's widow, Roma Egan, and their daughter, Rachel Egan, also appeared on the 60 Minutes, saying that the Somerton man was Robin Thompson's father and therefore Rachel's grandfather. The Egans reported lodging a new application by the Attorney General of South Australia, John Rao, to have the Somerton man's body finally exhumed and DNA tested. Derek Abbott also subsequently wrote to Rao in support of the Egans, and Derek Abbott actually married Rachel Egan. So this is the guy, this is the... uh, he reopened the investigation. He was a professor at University of Adelaide, and she is the great-granddaughter of Jessica, of Jessica Thompson. So with death, there also brings love and new life. Anyway, they're still trying to get that shit exhumed. They're still struggling. This is a case that has been decades in the making and has so many different parts involved in it, so many different mysterious elements A lot of what I found for this specific episode is from Wikipedia, but I also want to credit The Lost Man by Graham Wood. Uh, It's from California Sunday Magazine, ABC News Reporting, and, of course, Abbott Derrick and the University of Adelaide. I wonder if, with things like this, does finding, like, definitively the answer to the question, does that make it better or 
or does it make it worse? Because mm-hmm. once you find that information, stories, and this, I, you know, I'm kind of speaking on a bigger scale, like yeah. of, of mysteries, does it, like, would you rather know? Because instinctively, it's like, I want to know. Yeah. Just like anything, the end of what's happening at the end of the movie, the end of a book, uh, you know, the end of a, a mystery. But once you once you find out that answer, this is now no longer really a mystery. It's it's not a mystery. Yeah. And it's it's a kind of a less of an interesting story. And I wonder if that kind of ruins things. Especially, I mean, if it was you know happened today, it's like listen, I want to find out what happened to my you know husband. This is yeah. now we're down sixty something years ago, and no one claimed him back then. Yeah. So you know, no one's probably claiming him now yeah. for for whatever reason. So I just wonder what that would do to like this, this story as an example. Yeah. I don't know. And it's, it's weird too. Uh, this is another case of technology being really helpful along the way. And I guess like they couldn't get all the DNA off the hair, but they got a little bit. And then this thing happened and like this connection and what, like what are the chances of these people connect? What are the chances of like this woman having a baby by this guy who died and like knowing Russia and like, there's so many crazy components of this. Well, at the point where she was just like, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. That's, that's really where it ended for me. Mm-hmm. I mean, as far as, you know, it's like, oh, I can't believe we don't know. Well, the one person that probably seemed to know the most didn't even say I don't know. It was just like, I don't talk about it. Yeah. Which would never happen today for no. any reason. The leniency form. of the police on this and the, ugh, I feel like there's so many cases that we talk about where like evidence gets destroyed, yeah. you know, and shit goes missing. And it's like, I don't know. It happened a while ago. It's like, can we create a better filing system for this stuff yeah. so it doesn't... Or is that part of the conspiracy? Is that part of, like, the espionage kind of higher government thing that we don't know or we're just getting teased with? Well, if she, you know, it's just say she's a spy and mm-hmm. the training is, like, what do I do if I get caught and get interrogated? Just be like, I don't know. Yeah. And they'll just leave you alone. And then faint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, I think that's where... It, it's like, you know, once you do that, it's almost pointless. Like, well, okay... You seem to know a lot, but where you said you don't really want to, mm-hmm. so we'll just keep looking in a more difficult way and spend more time. You know, you have the answer yeah. possibly in front of you, but you're willing to. The person doesn't feel like it. Yeah, I don't feel like answering a question of something that I may have witnessed. I just yeah, like, I don't want to. I am. I'm probably going to be incredibly helpful to you, but mm, yeah. I don't care. I and we didn't mention this at the beginning of the show, but we actually do have the answer. But it's on patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're we'll keeping release it. release it when we feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you can also get two bonus episodes a month. That's right. It's going to be nice. Uh, one of our, uh, somebody who contacted, uh, well, you know, a listener contacted us on Instagram, mm-hmm. suggested one. I'm going to say what it is. Yeah. yeah. Listen, it's a good one. It hits all the points. It hits, yeah. it hits haunted. It hits mm-hmm. crime. It mm-hmm. hits abandoned. Yes. It hits all the points. So if you go to patreon.com slash ghost town pod, bonus episodes, supports us, supports the show, keeps Absolutely. us going. And you know, there's probably gotta be twenty something episodes. So it's not like you're just getting one like you can no, go back and get the whole the whole library. Yeah. You don't get to come in and like just get the one that you came in on. You get all of the ones that stood that you know standing on the shoulders of giants. How about standing on the shoulders of bonies? Yeah. Oh, you see when you do bonies. <laughs> I also want to, I totally forgot about this, but I want to call out the Integratron to, oh, yeah. um, they called me this week. We did an episode for yeah. those who maybe don't know a while back on the Integratron. Yeah. And I, as you probably also know from just the way that we are on this podcast, I almost immediately forget what we talk about after the episode is recorded. Cause I go back and, li- yeah. you know, Jason I is the, our the, master engineer and I am yeah. just, uh, so I hear it so many times. So, yeah. uh, yeah, so they called me and they were like, hey, are you Rebecca Lee? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, we, I'm Joanna from the Integratron. We listened to your episode about the Integratron. You should be like, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't feel like it. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, and I was like, oh, fuck. I was like, oh, fuck. Like, yeah, I was like, like, like oh, my you God. Like, you as you, you know, like, we could be we're a not little, story. Like, we're we could be a little cavalier about things, too. A which little. We don't, we don't, <laughs> but we're, our intention is never to be disrespectful. Of no. What, it's uh, us. We're cavalier about ourselves. Yeah. Not the subject matter. Yeah, we have a lot of reverence, I think, for the things we talk about. Anyway, she was like, we loved it. We're big fans here at their Integratron. We don't give interviews. We don't do media spots. But I just wanted to call. I saw that you're coming to the Integratron and say, because I've been going there for years and years, as I mentioned in the episode. And she's like, thank you. You treated it with respect. You treated it 
with uh, like what we had hoped people would get from it. You are, you are our audience, and we just want to say. Th-. And she was like, almost made me cry. It was so touching and lovely, and like so inspiring. And and yeah, I was like, oh my god. I'm I- surprised, and not only am I surprised, somebody who's cared directly involved with the mm-hmm. subject matter listens. I'm surprised literally any, anybody. Yeah, we're all this. Listens. Yeah, this is all like icing on the cake because we're like, nobody cares into the void. Yeah, but um, thank yeah. you for those. How you know, flattering. Thank you, Joanna from the Integratron. Yeah. I can't wait to visit. Um, we are humbled and flattered that you, the owner of the Integratron, part of history, listen to us. Especially California history, which yeah. is, you know, very You approve. And that, yeah, that's huge for us. So thank yeah. you so much. And thank you to anyone else who's listening that is not directly related to yeah, this Yeah, if you don't right? own a piece of history, that's cool, too. That's cool, too. And, yeah. you know, people have been leaving some really, uh, sometimes we take a beating on mm-hmm. Apple oh, Podcast yeah. reviews. Big time. So thank you for all, all of you who have gone and given it. Five stars, or at least giving it an honest review. Mm-hmm. No matter what it is, we appreciate it. It's just yeah. the thing when people are like, "Yeah, it's okay. I'll just give it a one." Mm-hmm. But that what? hurts. It, yeah. it doesn't doesn't help us. Hate it, but let us know why. Sure. So uh, if you haven't yet and you want to, um, it's it it's doesn't cost anything and it's very helpful to us. Mm-hmm. And you can always also message us uh, on Instagram at Ghost, Ghost Town, Town Pod. Pod. I oh, got you, that right. Oh, wow, great. Dumb and Busted has been called, quote, one of America's greatest treasures by three out of three hosts of the show. Dumb and Busted is a weekly true crime comedy podcast with stories of exceptionally smart and insanely dumb crimes. Comedian Hunter Donaldson has hailed it as the greatest thing to come out of Portland since comedian Hunter Donaldson, who is me, also a host of the show. Podcasters Allison Copeland and Hannah Ether praise Dumb and Busted as, quote, found on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Just more rave reviews from two other people who host the show. Catch us every Thursday and follow us at Dumb and Busted on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Crime you later!